All right, good morning, guys. Uh, we're going to finish our 5.2 worksheet, and then uh, we'll move on to 5.4. So let's uh, review. I think we stopped with long division, so let's review long division, and then we'll talk about an alternate method, which is synthetic division. So there's pros and cons with long division versus synthetic division, and we'll talk about um, um, both of them uh, uh, in detail. But let me first revisit uh, the last problem that we did in class, which was the long division problem. This is number five. So as a recap, we talked about how every time we see an integral problem, we should always consider is that something that we can just move terms around and get it ready for power rule, or we can just not have to rely on anything more complex than just power rule. And uh, we always want to do this first because uh, if we start off with u substitution being our first option, and if we run into a dead end, it's a lot harder for students to figure out that maybe it's a, a expansion problem. So we always want to just get this out of the way before we move on to something else. And usually we should be able to look at a problem and within in a few moments, be able to figure out, yes, I can I can handle this problem using just moving things around, or it's too complex, uh, things doesn't work, or um, uh, it's not convenient for us to 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 move uh, to get it to this point. And for number five, you can quickly tell by looking at the denominator, x plus five. Anytime you have more multiple terms added or subtracted in the denominator, it's already going to make it too difficult, too messy to move it and to um, get it to where we can expand. So our second option was uh, use substitution. And if we think about use substitution, we usually want to, if you're looking at a rational function, you usually want to target the denominator to be the u value. So if we let the u value be x plus 5, that's not ideal because the derivative of x plus 5 is not going to be able to handle this x cubed minus 6x minus 20. So now we have a third option, right? We're going, we're making our way down this checklist, and this checklist will extend further once we go further into chapters five and six or the rest of chapter five. But right now, our third item on our checklist is long division. And long division gives us a different form of the problem. It doesn't solve the problem for us. And the way that we can tell whether long division may be a good fit is obviously you want to go through your first two options and because it doesn't work we're now looking at long division and you want to look at your degrees you want to compare your numerator degree with your denominator degree this is third power that's the first power in order for long division to work your numerator degree needs to be at least as high if not higher than your denominator degree and we do see that relationship here and we can move forward with long division so long division, we write it in this form here. We match our terms. X times what gives me X cubed, which is X squared. We find that first term of our quotient, distribute it through our divisor. Make sure it helps if you put the parentheses around the divisor. When you multiply, distribute through, you're going to write your terms down below, draw your line, change your signs, and your first term will always match and cancel out. After that, you got to be careful because we may not have like terms that are mashed up um, above each other. So you got to look. If I don't see like terms, then I have to bring them down separately. And when you bring them down separately, make sure you bring them down in descending order of, of exponents. So x squared comes first, followed by x, 6x, followed by the 20. Repeat the process. X times what gives me negative 5x squared. Distribute, bring that term down, draw your line, change your signs, add. If there's like terms, you add accordingly. And you keep repeating that process until you get to the point where your term that you bring down is all of a sudden below the degree of your, um, of your divisor. Once it falls below, we can't go any further. We call that the remainder and we rewrite and we write the remainder as uh, the value over the divisor. 
Now this is not the solution, but this is a different variation of this original problem. Okay, these are equivalent, but this is easier for us to work with from a calculus perspective than this one. So now once we're here, we, we uh, revisit the problem. And we look at each term separately. These are nice because these are all individual terms that can all be handled using power rule. This last term, we can go through use substitution and find the antiderivative. And the hope is that we can be able to move from here to here without having to go through all these additional steps. And I would suggest that we do that, especially for these easier u substitution problems where your u value is x plus five. There's no leftover x you got to worry about. There's no leftover coefficient. It's just going to be you drop the coefficient. Oh, sorry, you bring down the coefficients. X plus five is in the denominator, so it's going to become natural log of absolute value of x plus five, and then there you end the problem. It's nice to know how that process is, you know, is achieved. But for these easy problems, I think you guys can make this jump without having to write this down every time. Okay. But you can make that decision once you're comfortable with it. All right, so that's the long division process. Any questions with that? No, okay. Now let's revisit this same problem. But now let's look at it from uh, another. Let's look at it from a, a process that I want to talk about, which is synthetic division. OK, so here is example five, and we're going to look at 5B method two. Synthetic division. Same problem. Different process though. So uh, we went through all the um, all of our checklist term uh, items, power rule, u substitution, and we ended up at long division. So we know we can solve using long division, but we can also solve this using what we call synthetic division. So let me write down when we know we can potentially use synthetic division. So synthetic division can be applied for a long division problem if the degree in the denominator is to the first degree. meaning a linear term. So we already know that long division, uh, this fits the criteria for long division, but we can do synthetic division, which is a faster process, if the denominator is just x to the first power. If the denominator is any higher, x squared, x cubed, even if it is lower than the, than the numerator is not going to work. OK, so it's more restrictive than long division, but it's it can solve certain problems faster or it can get to where we want to be faster. So let's talk about how uh, the long division process works. First thing we do is we need to find the factor. So the factor is going to come from the denominator. And you're going to set that expression equal to zero and solve for X. Basically, it's just going to be the opposite sign. So in this case, x plus 5 is equal to 0. x equals negative 5, so we're going to be using negative 5. 
things. You're going to put negative five down on your paper. You're going to create kind of a, a half rectangular box. And now we're going to be able to just keep track of the coefficients and not have to worry about all the uh, the variable mess that comes along with long division. So we're going to be writing down the coefficients of each of our dividend terms. Now, do you see any degree that's been skipped over that's not represented by what you see here? X squared. X squared. So that's important. If you see any degree that's skipped over, we need to have a placeholder for that degree, and that placeholder is going to be represented by zero. So we'll have one for x cubed. There's no x squared, but we need to have a, a placeholder for it, so we'll put zero in for the x squared. Oops, sorry. Uh, negative 6x is the linear term, so that's my next term. So got a term. I got a coefficient for x cubed, a coefficient for x squared, a coefficient for x, and I also have a constant, negative 20. Okay, any questions so far? We only have to worry about zero for any degrees that were skipped over. What that mean by that is, let's say there wasn't a constant in the problem, and it was just x cubed minus six x. If that were the case, then you would just say one, zero, negative six. You won't have to put a zero for any degree that was left off at the end. Only have to include zeros if it skips over a degree in your expression. OK, so here is the rest of the process. We're going to bring the first number down below the line. Just drag it down below the line. Next up, you're going to multiply. Negative 5 times 1 is negative 5. You're going to put that number uh, in that second column below the 0, but above the line. Okay. Add 0 minus 5 is negative 5. Bring it down below the line. Multiply. Negative 5 times negative 5 is 25. Put it below the, six, no, the negative 6. Add. 19, bring it down below the line. Good. And add again. Negative 115. Okay, so we, we recognize these numbers because we just we just did um, long division with the exact same problem. Now let me point something out here. We started with x cubed, right? But I'm dividing by x. So what's going to happen with the degree, the highest degree of my resulting quotient? Square. It's going to drop by one. I'm with with uh, with synthetic division. I'm always going to be dividing by x to the first power. So when I go through that division process, I'm losing a degree. So we need to make that adjustment. Whatever we bring down, it's going to be one degree lower than what we started with. So this is now going to be what? X squared. Now, once you have that starting degree, you're now going to assign the remaining degree of the terms that you brought down, but they're all going to drop by one as well. So if this is X squared. My next is going to be X, and this is going to be constant, right? And if there's anything after the constant, this is going to be the, the remainder. And the remainder, you're going to put it over your original divisor. So we're able to get to the same place as, where, as, uh, as we did using long division, but a little faster and not having to write down as many cumbersome variables. But keep in mind, we haven't solved the problem. We would still have to go through the calculus procedure to finish off the problem. 
but I'm going to stop here because it's the same process after this, and I just want us to see that process for synthetic division. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, uh, let me talk about um, when we want to be using or choosing between long division and synthetic division, and also the pros and cons. So with long division, it can handle all synthetic division problems. So the advantage of long division is that it's um, uh, it's more robust, right? It can handle um, x to the first power. It can handle x squared as long as it falls within this condition of the degree being greater than or equal to the denominator. Long division is good. So if you're only wanting to learn one method, then long division is the way to go, right? But the disadvantage is that it's just for problems like this, there's a speedier process, there's a faster process using synthetic division. Um, and it's, you know, it's a cumbersome process. Now, synthetic division, the advantage is that for certain problems like this one, it's faster, right? You can get down to the expression without having to write down all this mess, take up taking up a full page just to get down to this process. Disadvantage is it's more restrictive, right? It can only handle anything that is a linear degree. And second, it's kind of gimmicky, right? You kind of have to know all this, memorize all this process. You got to know to bring the term below uh, the line. You got to remember that uh, missing degrees, you need to have a placeholder for it. You got to remember that all these degrees are going to fall by one. You got to remember that um, you're always going to be dropping your initial degree by one as well. So, you know, you got to memorize a whole lot uh, to do this. And if you miss a step, it's hard to go back and double check uh, your work. Uh, or if you, if you forget a step, it's hard to figure out uh, just by the process. Um, but uh, long division is more straightforward. It's, uh, it's messier, but it makes sense. You're just multiplying and adding or subtracting and you're um, you're repeating the same process. So ideally, uh, you know both methods, right? You can handle long division for the problems that require long division, but then you can get past the easier problems that are synthetic and you can save yourself time. So ideally, you, you know both methods, but if you're only going to know one method, then stick with long division. All right, any questions? OK, we skipped over example three, so let's go back and revisit example three. And now I think we're going to be able to handle this problem with uh, the knowledge that we have from these recent process. Okay, example three off the first page. All right, so we go we go through our process. Can we handle this problem using power rule? No. Yeah. Too many terms in the denominator. Okay, we can quickly eliminate this option. All right, next option, u substitution. Can we let the u value be maybe the entire denominator? Oh. Yeah, the degree is not ideal, right? I, you know, if we have x cubed and then x squared, maybe that can handle the numerator, but yeah, we can't uh, can't make much progress with u substitution. So we have our third option now, which is long division. Okay. Does this fulfill the condition that we need for long division? Yes. Yeah, our degree is good, right? Because all we need, this is barely uh, fits that condition, but our numerator degree does end up being the same, if not larger. In this case, it's the same, so we're good with this uh, condition here. So let's explore our long division process. Oh, can we do synthetic here? No, x squared too high, right? This is one where if we want to do long, if we want to do a division process, it's got to be long division. And again, we're doing long division because this, we can't find a rule that can handle this problem. So hopefully with long division, it can split up into easier parts for us to manage with the rules that we have available. OK. 
first things first, we match our terms. X squared times what gives me X squared? One. one. So we put a one above. It's helpful. I think it's visually helpful if you can put your um, your divisor in a set of parentheses. So as a reminder that you're going to distribute through the parentheses. One times X squared is X squared. One times one is one. Draw your line, change your signs. Your first term will always match up nicely, it will always go away nicely. But the remaining, we got to be aware that things may not be lined up. So do you see anything that can cancel out here? Or anything that I can combine? Not the X and negative one, but what about OK, this, right? So you may, the things may be misaligned, so you may have to kind of just look at, look at all the terms to see, all right, do I see any pairs that can, that can put together? So one minus one goes away nicely. It's just zero, so the only thing that is left is what? X. X. Okay. OK, so we go back to square one. Can I go any further? X squared times what gives me X? X to the negative one. X to the negative one. And then that is, that's too low. Okay, so we're not going to be dealing with negative exponents. So as soon as you see your ver your uh, degree drop below your divisor degree, then we stop and we call this the what? The remainder. And how do we write the remainder term? Good. We can't divide this any further, so we're going to represent that by writing out x over x squared plus 1. This expression is not complete, but hopefully it can be an easier problem for us to solve. So I'll put that to the side here. I want you guys to understand that this problem and this expression, these are the exact same thing. But this is a friendlier version for our process that we want to apply. Now, I think this is going to be easier to work with than this, right, because we are instantly see that we already have two separate terms, so we can treat them individual from each other, apart from each other. What happens to the one? Um, Turns to the x, right? So we just do power rule. I'm just going to indicate power rule for this uh, term here. Okay. What can we handle with this expression? Your substitution, right? So that's nice. We can completely separate our two terms and treat them like as if uh, you know, there, there's no impact uh, one on the other. So let me write them down separately. You guys have to write as many steps here if you don't want, but just cleaner um, presentation here. Okay, we already know power rule for this. Well, let's do the, the harder one first. Okay, what's our U value? Good. Entire denominator, right? We want to target the denominator. Usually it's the entire denominator. All right. U is x squared plus 1. DU dx. Make my substitutions. I'm going to carry this over here. Um, I'm just going to replace what I underlined. All right, are things going to work out here? X's goes away nicely. What can we do to clean this up? 
push out what? The two. Okay, and the two comes out as? Uh, one, half. one half, okay. Okay, do we have a rule for one over u? Yes. That's just what? Ln. Yeah, natural log, okay. U is only a temporary variable. Let's bring back our original expression. All right, so we solved the, the, uh, the more uh, involved part, and now we can bring down this one, right? One is just what again? X. X. There we go. Okay, questions. So we, we see that our problems are getting longer and longer, right? The process becoming longer and longer. In this case, we have to go through long division just to get the problem set to be something that we can use with calculus. And then once we're there, we realize that there were two separate problems. And one was just power rule, but the, the other is use substitution. So we got to handle that smaller part of the problem get that resolved, and then finally put those two pieces together. So you know, we're kind of seeing not only um, the, uh, the availability of more rules, but then uh, sometimes our process is going to become longer and longer. We have a problem within the problem within the problem sometimes. OK, any questions? All right, let's look to today's topic, which is exponential functions, e to the u. Let's revisit what we learned first semester. We learned that the derivative of e to the u, which is e to the u times u prime. Let's just do a quick example of that. If my function, let's say, is e to the um, x squared minus 3x, what would f prime be? So e my... To the x squared minus 3x mm -hmm. um, times 2x minus 3 Good. So the nice thing about e to the u is you're always going to be copying the exact same problem from before. Your derivative is the function itself. But if there's any leftover, uh, anything that's more involved than the x for your exponent, we got to make sure we involve the derivative as well. So times 2x minus 3. So I'm just following the rule here. e to the u becomes e to the u times u prime. OK, so that's first semester, uh, the derivative process involving chain rule. But what I want to bring up is the fact that you're your exponential function didn't change, right? It didn't change. So if my derivative process didn't change the function, then the integral process is not going to be much change either. So that's why when we work backwards, integral of e to the u is also going to bring us back to the same function as well. And all the messiness of uh, the chain rule that can occur is going to all be contained within u substitution for this process. Okay, so we're going to practice with this rule here. And let's start off with example one. Integral of e to the 3x plus 1. Do you see how this could potentially match with the rule that we want to target? And if we do, what's our u value going to be? 3x plus 1. 3x plus 1. OK, so here's something I want to point out. If you want to use the e to the u rule, you have to let the entire exponent be the u value. OK, and the reason why I'm bringing that up is because if you don't let the entire exponent be the u value, then you may have um, a resulting expression that looks like this rule, but is a little bit off. And I want to point out that even if you're just a little bit off with the rule that's available, there's no rule to use. So let's say you end up with e to the 2u or e to the square root of u, or e to the u squared. It looks like the rule, but we can't use it, okay? It's literally got to be to the letter, 
like if there is even one change, assuming that you've already pulled out the coefficient, right? Once you pull the coefficient out, it needs to match the letter. If there's one little change, it's not going to be right. OK, so if you want to go through this, if you want to go through this uh, e to the u rule, the only way to do it is to let the entire exponent be the u value. OK, all right, let's see where this leads. The u dx. Cross multiply. Divide both sides by three. We want to get that dx by itself. And substitute. All right. Getting closer, what can we do to make this a little cleaner? Yeah, push out one third. Okay. Now let's look. Is this a perfect match with this rule? Yes. Yeah, to the letter, right? We don't see a single change. Once you cover up that one third, you don't see a single change, and that's when you know there's a rule that you can use. Anything else we can do? Yeah, let's get that 3x plus 1 back into our answer. Okay, any questions with one? All right, number two. All right, so here are the uh, some of the relevant derivative and integral rules that we need. And some students have been asking about this. Uh, is there a place that um, you could just have all the rules together? So I'm going to be working on that. I'll put together a formula sheet that is just for this upcoming quiz with all the relevant information on that page. On that page. And I'll put it under tomorrow's link. So uh, before tomorrow's class, it'll be there and then you can print it out and you can have it next to you. We can just have it all all the formulas that you need in one place. OK, but for now, I just created this makeshift uh, formula sheet uh, for us to refer to. OK, let's look at example two here. Cosine of X times E to the sine X. Maybe we see a couple of rules here. We see cosine, we see sine, we see E to the U. But notice that they're all connected by either multiplication or um, exponential, right? So we can't pick and choose different rules and say, OK, I got a rule for cosine, I got a rule for sine, I got a rule for E, and just merge them all together. This is too complex for one rule to handle because they're all multiplied or raised to an exponent. Now, if it was cosine of x plus E to the x plus sine of x, then you're free to treat each like a separate problem, and each, the, each of these rules can be applied separately. But this is too messy. If it's too messy for one rule to handle, then we have to explore u substitution. So now the next question is, what's a suitable u value that will allow our problem to look like one of our integral rules and allow all the x's to disappear and cancel out? Okay. So maybe it's e to the u, maybe it's cosine of u. Lauren, what'd you say? So if we let the u value be sine of x, maybe that can help us get down to this e to the u. Let me talk about why this cosine is not a good fit. If I try to go after the cosine, that means I got to have the x and the e to the sine x as part of the u value. And we know that the e to the sine is not inside the cosine, so it's not going to be a good fit for that u value. Even if it were, the derivative of x e to the sine x is going to produce a messy product chain rule that we have that, that has no chance of being matched with the rest of the problem, right? So if we go down that line, we can quickly see that it's not going to work out. So let's explore this e to the u. Okay, so let's target that exponent. And that means we're leaving the cosine out of this process. OK, 
can we eventually see that cosine going away down the road? Yes. Yeah. Sine's derivative is cosine, and we have a, we have something to pair up with the derivative that we're going to come from that u value. Okay. Okay, so I'm just trying to help you kind of look ahead into the problem. The further you can look ahead, the more uh, confidence you can have going into the process and also um, the less potential dead end that 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 uh, that may result. OK, du dx. Okay. First semester we learned sine's derivative is cosine. Cross multiply. OK, divide cosine over. Make our substitutions. I'm just replacing what I had in red here. All right, do things work out here? X's, right? Cosine X pairs up nicely. One's in the numerator, the other's in the denominator. We can cancel those out. No leftover, co no leftover coefficients, so all we have left is integral of v to the u. Okay, do we have a perfect match? Yes, so we know we can apply this rule now. Okay, don't just stop there. We have one more thing to do. Bring that x variable back in. All right, questions with two. Okay, let's look at number three. Integral of e to the x over two plus e to the x. Okay, I'm looking for expansion opportunities. Can I bring that two plus e to the x up? I could, but then that's going to be left with 2 plus e to the x to the negative 1, and I'm not going to be able to merge with that e to the x here. Too many terms in the denominator separate by plus or minus. So we can't move it. Uh, things are kind of stuck where they are. So next option is use substitution. All right, so what could be a good u value for this problem? Maybe it's e to the x for the numerator. Maybe it's e to the x in the denominator. Maybe it's both e to the x in the numerator and denominator. Maybe it's the entire denominator. Okay, I think that entire denominator is a good place to start. Let me talk about why that e to the x may not be enough. This e to the x first step is that if I pick the numerator, that's already a bad place to look for the u value. And another uh, negative thing about this e to the x is if you just pick it in the denominator or if you let the e to the x be both the numerator and denominator, it's still a rather small portion of the problem. Usually we want our u value to be a more significant portion of the problem so that we can um, get things, especially if you have numerator and denominator involved. Um, so denominator is a good place to look and we're going to let the entire denominator be the u value. Because when we do that, we can make it a little cleaner and we're not gonna, we're not left with a two to match up, right? We don't see any twos showing up in our rule here. So let's go after the entire denominator. Right? We'll leave that e to the x up top, hoping that this process will take care of it once we we're ready to cancel out. We're going to go ahead and find a derivative. Remember, e to the u is just e to the u times u prime. 2 goes away to 0. e to the x becomes e to the x times 1. You don't have to put that 1 there. I just wanted to remind us that right, every problem, we're always doing a little bit of a chain rule or looking for it at least.
solve for dx, move that e to the x over. And let's see where that um, what's left here. All right, we got a clean pairing here, right? Do we have a rule that we can use? Yeah. Perfect match, right? No coefficients. Even if there were, it'll be a perfect match. Natural law. Bring your X's back. Questions? Okay, let's do one more. Number four on the back page. OK, take a look at number four. It kind of looks like number two. You got e to the x, you got cosine involved. Um, but is this going to be a little different? I'm looking at the e to the x, e to the u rule. I'm looking at the cosine rule. First off, we know it's u substitution, right? This is too messy for one rule to, to manage. All right. What do you think could be a better target for this problem? The e to the u rule or the cosine of u rule? Cosine, rule? cosine u rule. OK, what's wrong with e to the u? Yeah, if I want to use if I want to use e to the x, then or e to the u, then my u is my x. And that's usually we, we don't do that, right? There's no need for u substitution if we're only replacing one variable. So I think the cosine is going to be a better fit. But if we want to target the cosine, then what's our u value going to be? Oh, yeah. You do the x inside the parentheses. OK, OK, so that's something we got we to think about, right? We have, we see the parentheses, that's good. But there's two e to the x's, so how do we know whether to use both or one or which one to choose? You're right. It's the e to the x, but why not this one as well? Right, we're looking ahead, right? We're looking ahead and we, we realize that e to the x derivative is not going to go away on its own. It needs some support. So without knowing that, right, without looking ahead, it's impossible to know what your u values is, but because you know, we're getting in, into that habit of looking at problems, looking at patterns. We're predicting what's going to happen. And we're saving this for the derivative. And we're letting this hang out on its own. And we're just letting this be the u value, right? So, you know, I think that's tough. I think that's tough to, to know that um, without practicing and seeing it and, and seeing things over and over again and recognizing patterns of what could happen uh, down the road. Good. But uh, yep, we just want to let the u value be what's inside the parentheses. And we're not going to touch that e to the x, not yet. OK, du dx. Cross multiply. Solve for dx. Make our substitutions. Okay. 
e to the x, e to the x, just like what we suspected, right? We know the derivative is going to produce something, and we're already sitting here waiting for it to, to come up. Perfect match with our cosine rule becomes sine u plus c. And then bring our e to the x back in. Okay, any questions here? All right. Okay, so that's all I have. Uh, to, uh, tomorrow we'll finish the rest of this worksheet. We'll start 5.5. Uh, I'll have a formula sheet uh, under tomorrow's link so you can print that out. And um, 5.5, we're going to see just the same types of problems, just a different base. Instead of base E, it's base A. Uh, and we should have more rules to match, but I think we can begin starting our review tomorrow. Monday review as well, and then Tuesday quiz, just over, basically just over these type of use substitution type problems. All right, thanks everyone. Hope you guys have a great day. See you tomorrow.